Welcome back everyone to our microbiology lecture series. Today we will be learning all about prokaryotes and in this lecture in particular we will learn about how we classify and how we identify our prokaryotes. So the first question we have to ask and answer is what is a prokaryote? If we break this word down, the beginning of the word pro means before and karyo means nucleus. So these are organisms that existed before a nucleus, or these ones are the ones that don't have a nucleus. We commonly know our prokaryotes as bacteria. Now if you have this bacteria diagram in front of you, go ahead and um, take it out. If not, I want you to pause for a second and draw a quick sketch of it into your notes so that you can label the parts along with us. Okay, now that you have your bacteria diagram, let's look at what is actually inside our prokaryotes. So this blue squiggly stuff in the middle um, is the bacteria's DNA. And unlike humans who have 23 pairs of chromosomes, bacteria have one singular chromosome and that chromosome is circular, unlike humans whose chromosomes are linear. Okay, bacteria then use their ribosomes to translate the RNA made from that DNA into the proteins for the bacteria. Okay. Surrounding both the DNA and the ribosomes, just like in a eukaryotic cell, is then the cytoplasm. Okay. So now let's move to the outside of our bacterial cell. Some, not all bacteria, have this whip apparatus at the end of it, which is called a flagellum, that they use to propel themselves through liquid. Many bacteria also have these little membrane extensions called pili. Now these look a lot like cilia, but they're structurally different, which is why they have a different name. Now let's take a look at the outer three layers of our bacteria. The very outermost one is called the capsule, and that capsule is made of membrane. Our next layer in is the cell wall. And inside the cell wall is another membrane, which we usually call our plasma membrane. Now if you notice, bacteria are unique in this outer structure. They're the only ones that go membrane, wall, membrane, and have two membranes on the outside of them. Okay. So now that we know what they look like, let's start to talk about how we can classify them. Oh, before classification, what they are. So among living organisms, bacteria are the oldest. They're the most abundant, and they're the most widely found. They are probably also among the most diverse, it's just that our identification techniques haven't quite caught up with them yet. So within um, these old, abundant, widely found organisms, we've got two main groups, and these two groups are actually divided at the level of domains. So let's take a look at our first domain. Our first domain is the eubacteria. Now, this word eubacteria means true bacteria and typically includes the bacteria that live in non-extreme environments. And these eubacteria also have cell walls that are made of a molecule called peptidoglycan. Now if we break down this word peptidoglycan, you'll see peptide, which has to do with amino acids and proteins, and glyca or gluca, which has to do with sugar. So we know it has to do with some kinds of peptides and sugars being put together. Now let's take a look at our other group, our archaebacteria. This word archaebacteria means ancient bacteria. And these archaebacteria are different from eubacteria in a number of ways, one of which is that they are typically found in extreme environments, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Another difference that is really major when it comes to classification, but we don't tend to think about, is that their cell walls do not have peptidoglycan. Now again, this may seem like a very minor difference to us, but if you think about it, one of the things that makes a fungus different from a plant and a plant different from a protist is 
what their cell walls are made of. So this is a big dividing thing um, between our two groups of bacteria. So let's pause for a second on our archaeobacteria. Okay, our archaeobacteria are extremophiles, which just means that they love extreme environments. And we're going to take a look at five different types of these extremophiles and where they might live. So our first type is our thermophiles, which as the name suggests, these ones like heat or hot environments. Okay. An example of a hot environment where you might find them is a deep sea hydrothermal vent or a geyser or a hot spring. Okay. In contrast, our psychrophiles like to live in places where it is cold. So places like glaciers or the tundra. We can also have acidophiles. No surprise, these acidophiles like to live in places where it is acidic. And this can include places like geysers or hot springs. Sometimes even your stomach, they found a couple of species of bacteria that can live in your very acidic stomach. And then opposite to those, we have ones that like to live in very basic environments, and those are called alkalophiles. Basic environments are a little bit more rare. One place we see them is in the runoff from mines. And then our last group of extremophiles is are halophiles. Now halophiles like to live where it is really salty and by salty we mean saltier than the ocean. So these are places like the Great Salt Lake, the Dead Sea, or as is shown in this picture, places where they are farming or harvesting salt. So as you fly over some places you will see these big pink patches. Those are places where they've gathered seawater together, they're letting it evaporate. A lot of these halophiles actually make a red pigment and so when the salt starts to concentrate, the halophiles start growing, these big patches or fields end up looking pink. So those are our extremophiles, and now we're going to leave them behind so that we can talk about bacteria and you. Now the bacteria that normally live in or on an organism's body are called the normal flora. And these are almost always going to be our eubacteria. Now among these, we have two different types that we're going to take a look at. The first is our transient flora. Now if you were in class the first day, you'll remember that one of the plates that we cultured was our T plate, and T was for transient. Okay? So our transient flora is the bacteria that is temporarily in or on the body. If you were in class, you'll remember that our transient flora was the bacteria that we collected before we washed our hands. Okay? This is picked up from the environment and whether you get that by touching something or inhaling something or ingesting something, whatever the case, the transient flora are picked up from the environment. Among these two types, transient and resident, the transient is more likely to be pathogenic um, or is possibly pathogenic, not always, but it's possible. And when we say that something is pathogenic, we mean that it causes disease. Again, not every transient bacteria is pathogenic, but it's possible. Now let's take a look at our resident flora. Again, if you were in class, our resident flora was marked with an R. These were the bacteria that we had after washing our hands. So our resident flora um, live in or on the body for a long time. These ones, places where we have a lot of these, our intestines are chock full of bacteria. Also our skin, and in particular our pores, our nice little bacteria caves. For those microbes, we also have a lot in our mouths and in our nose in particular. Okay? Now these ones are almost always helpful or harmless. 
Now let's pause for a second and think about why we would not have a harmful bacteria living on our body for a long time. Okay, um, if you think about it, if you get a harmful bacteria into your body, either your body's going to kill it or it kills you. Somebody has to win. There is no peacefully living with a harmful bacteria, which is why we don't have harmful resident flora. But it is possible to pick them up from the environment. So now let's take a look at how we identify these bacteria. We're going to identify them in a few different ways. One is their macro characteristics, which is what they look like growing on a plate or by, from, by the, with the naked eye. Okay. One of the ways we can identify them is by their habitat. If, for example, they were picked up from a hot spring, they're probably not one of your normal flora. Another way is by whether they're aerobic, which means they use oxygen, or anaerobic, which means they don't use oxygen. Okay. And then lastly, what we'll use in class is their colony characteristics. So a colony, when we look at it, is one of these circles on our plate. Okay. Each colony starts as one bacteria and is basically a pile of clones of that one bacteria. And what we can use to our advantage is each species of bacteria makes a different looking colony. So they may differ in size, um, in color, in texture. Those are all ways we can identify our bacteria. Another way we can identify them is under the microscope. And these are going to be your micro characteristics, which is what the cells look like under a microscope. Okay, we're going to call this our cell morphology. Um, the cell morphology is the cell shape and grouping. Okay. We're actually going to start with the grouping because the grouping often forms the prefix for our bacteria names. Okay. So our first grouping right here, our first prefix is for single cells, bacteria that are alone, we use the prefix mono. For bacteria that are in pairs, we use the prefix diplo. For bacteria that are in chains, we use the prefix strepto. And for bacteria that are in clusters, we use the prefix staphylo. And if you need to pause for a second, draw these and write those names down, go ahead and do that. Okay. The shape then often forms the suffix for a lot of our bacteria names. Okay. And we've got three general shapes. Our first shape is a circular bacteria for which we use the suffix coccus. Okay. Um, we also have a rod shaped bacteria, which we use the suffix bacillus. And then we have a spiral-shaped bacteria, which is called a spirillum or a spirochete. So streptococcus bacteria, for example, would be strepto, chains, of coccus, circular bacteria. Okay. Now one other way we can identify our bacteria is by their gram stain status. So bacteria, if we just put them under the microscope, we couldn't really see them because they're too small and they wouldn't have enough color. So we stain them. And we stain them with something called gram stain. And what you need to know about gram stain is that if it's gram positive, it stains purple, red, purple, or bluish purple. And if it's gram negative, it stains pink or red. Um, what this has to do is with the presence of a capsule. So on a gram negative bacteria, there is a capsule and that blocks more of the dye from binding to it. So they end up being pink instead of purple. But for a gram positive bacteria, there is no capsule. So all that purple dye can bind to the cell wall and it makes the cells look purple. So if, for example, we take a look at this um, view from a microscope, you can see that our gram-positive bacteria, the purple ones, are staphylococcus because they are clusters of circles, circular cells, and our gram-negative ones are a diplobacillus because they are in pairs of rod-shaped bacteria. All right, that is it for identifying our bacteria. Um, tune back in for more info on how bacteria reproduce.